Um, so Ashley um, uh, has worked in the movement to end gendered violence uh, for well over a decade, is currently employed at a state sexual assault coalition where she primarily conducts national sexual and domestic violence prevention work. Um, a preventionist at heart, uh, Ms. Mayor has managed a state rape prevention uh, and education program and grantees and coordinated uh, pediatric re residency training programs in community health and family violence. Served as an advocate and support group therapist for women experiencing domestic and sexual violence, and has worked uh, as a psychology faculty and more. So, Ashley, you are ready to go, and I will um, just open up your presentation. Great. And can you hear me? It was telling me it couldn't hear my mic. Can everyone hear Ashley? Okay, great. I got a notice that it couldn't hear me. So as my presentation opens up, I'll just, you know, thank you again. Thank you for um, all the great contributions to this conference and for, for putting on a conference uh, that conference. allows a space like this to, um, to, to be here. I think it's something that's definitely needed. So I'm going to talk about violence against women and animal rights and making what I call the highly unpopular connection. And of course, I have to give a big trigger warning. This is about violence against women. I've done my best not to use pictures that portray a lot of violence against women, but there are some. And of course, the what we'll be discussing um, inherently has to do with violence and could be triggering. So why am I calling this highly unpopular? I think that that's something that's important to talk about. I've been all over. This is really an applied presentation because I've done applied work. So this is from the perspective of someone who's been doing this work in the United States in a number of different states. And I now work for a statewide sexual assault coalition doing national prevention work. And I have to be very clear that I am not in any way speaking on behalf of my organization um, in which I am employed. I'm speaking on my own behalf here. But what's interesting is you know, we talk so much in the prevention world about going beyond brochures. But that's exactly what really um, made me aware of and make these connections. So why vegan brochure from Vegan Outreach turned me into a defiant daughter. So you may be aware, may not, of this book, Defiant Daughters, 21 Women on Art, Activism, Animals, and the Sexual Politics of Meat. That is really about how Carol J. Adams' sexual politics of meat really impacted our lives um, and our work. And so I talk about this transition and, um, you know, I was doing work against domestic violence. When I became vegan, I saw these connections and I faced a lot of resistance. So things like, um, you know, things maybe a lot of us have heard uh, and been told this is a very elitist um, position to be able to be a vegan. Um, it's, you know, really unfortunate that there are more shelters for animals than there are for women and things like that. So there really is a lot of resistance. But before we get into that, let's just talk a little bit around what violence against women, um, what I'm talking about when we talk about violence against women and what kind of the movement, I'll keep talking about the movement against violence against women. Um, it, you know, we really talk about many behaviors and labels. And the, a big point is that they really go beyond uh, just physical. We tend to think, we tend to see a lot of images of physical violence when we're talking about violence against women but definitely psychological, emotional, there's a lot. And we use a lot of different terms, and it's important that we focus on the fact that, you know, violence against women, which I often refer to as gendered violence, um, to get a little bit to challenge that gender binary that um, we, we can tend to use. But so you'll hear me using both terms in this presentation. So when we talk about gendered violence or violence against women. We also are talking about things like street harassment. We're talking about state violence against women. And we really have to recognize that while we recognize that women are disproportionately affected by things by intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and stalking, there is no one monolithic group of women. So our intersecting identities really impact our experiences with violence. And just um, so you know, this our latest statistics here in the United States that we have are from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. 
Oh, it didn't get on the screen. So oppression um, is usually is what we refer to um, most in the movement against violence against women. Agree that oppression is a root cause of um, gendered violence and violence against women, and so that's the first place we're going to see a connection between animal rights and anti-violence against women work. I really want us to look at expanding our notion of gendered violence, and I've done some work about this. So we've already had great presentations by Carol um, J. Adams, and we had Daniel talking about this as well. But many of us who are on right now, you know, we can look at things like cartons of eggs um, at a grocery store, and we can see and know that that product is itself gendered. And we can also know that it is a product of and really replicates gendered violence. We have female chickens or hens who really, if you go back, you know, to the very beginning have been completely manipulated so that they've been bred to have these reproductive systems that never were supposed to be um, producing the way they are. But also, you know, they're in these battery cages. They're extremely physically um, just, you know, malnourished. They're, they can't move. They um, experience all sorts of physical negative consequences that of course also lead to psychological negative consequences. This is gendered violence. For me, something that was really powerful and really had me uh, making the connections when I was doing, I was serving as an advocate for women who'd experienced domestic violence in a hospital-based setting was when I learned about dairy. So again, those of us who are on this um, web conference, we can probably look at this picture of what is supposed to be you know, a gallon of cow's milk and we can see that that is a gendered product. It is based on um, the manipulation of reproductive systems. So as Carol J. Adams says, it's a feminized protein. And we know when we look at it even further and how it's produced, and this is something that you know my colleagues are often shocked to learn about. I often say, how can any industry that uses something called a rape rack to forcibly impregnate um, the animals that are producing the commodity, how can that not be gendered violence? Excuse me. Uh, and then with things that are a little bit more obvious, you know, we definitely see gendered violence behind them and inherent in them. This is a, a contraption that's used to breed um, dogs, and so female dogs are are put in this contraption. They're um, physically confined and then impregnated and on the site where I found this picture, it said, don't wait till she's in heat to try to order. That is gendered violence. And we can look at things like hormones. Um, so at least in the United States, you know, something like Premarin is an example of what we can use. It's, again, predicated on the control of female animals' reproductive systems and forced impregnation and constraint, physical constraint and lack of bodily autonomy to collect, in this case, urine um, in a very, um, very, you know, negative and uncomfortable way where um, mares, the female horses, are, um, they're, they're restricted from having enough water. They're kept dehydrated, so their urine can be even more concentrated to then produce this, um, this hormone pill. And this is a picture of a faux fur coat, so I just want to be clear with that. But even when we look at things like fur, we can see, again, that whole industry is predicated on reproduction. And we can really make connections about, in this case, you know, there's anal and vaginal electrocution to create this product um, that is often sold in a very sexualized way, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And there are so many more. I really do want to encourage you. I it's, it seems like there are people on this conference who do have a lot of expertise and experience around um, gendered violence. And so I really want to encourage you to use the, the text chat to kind of um, add to what I'm saying, um, because this you know, we could talk about this for weeks and weeks. So, so please do, if you have any comments or additions, please go ahead and use the text chat to add that in. What we've tended to, done, to do is um, we've made links, but they're, they're pretty limited. And so what I've seen, and I, it's, it's, you know, kind of, I don't want to do a false dichotomy here. I both celebrate it and I want us to go further is that we've made a connection to things like pet abuse. So we spent, uh, over, since I began this work way back in the late nineties, um, we really started focusing on the fact that, um, people who abuse pets, 
um, or abuse animals tend to become abusers of people too. Um, we started doing things like really fighting for legislation and have passed legislation that includes pets, but usually listed as property in orders of protection for people who have experienced domestic violence. Um, and you know, we've done a lot of work around the fact that pets are abused. We've done work around um, human-animal bond. But something I'd really like us to do is, is go further, really look at how we can go further. And so when we're doing this prevention work, there are a lot of concepts for connection. One of those has already been talked about a couple of times here. So um, whether we're looking at some of the original, uh, one of the original books, Transforming a Rape Culture here, um, that, that really specifically looked at rape culture, or a newer book, The Macho Paradox, um, when we talk about rape culture, these books tend to define them as cultures that glorify and sexualize male power and dominance. Um, Jacqueline Friedman, who is really well known in the United States, at least for um, this work against violence against women, she runs um, Women Action and the Media, or WAM, as they call it, is she calls rape culture a culture that gives license to rapists. And a lot of us tend to just refer to it as a culture that allows for rape, or we can extend it to violence against women. It allows for, it promotes violence against women, it creates the conditions in which violence against women can occur. And so you know, Carol, I think, does a wonderful job talking about rape culture and illustrating the connections there um, in the sexual politics of meat. So I want to look at it from the way in this um, prevention work and the prevention work that I'm doing now and kind of this um, field or movement, whatever you want to call it, how we're really talking about this a lot. And so one of the things that we might do is we tend to look at you know, what's the foundation. So we talk about um, a lot of times what's at the core. And so we might look at a house and say, you know, an industry promotes norms, which are often unspoken standards of behavior that lead to those behaviors. And so we might look at something like the music industry and say, you know, a certain type of music promotes entitlement of women and that um, perpetuates sexual violence. And then the, the culture that we're talking about here is full of these houses. Then. So, you know, this rape culture is full of all of these industries and these norms that are perpetuating and allowing violence against women to occur. But I really encourage us to look at, well, what other, you know, in a sense, houses are there? And so there are a lot of ways that we can make those connections by looking further or taking a deeper look at norms. And um, the Prevention Institute offers um, five norms that they say they've really found contribute to uh, violence against women in a culture that allows for violence against women to occur. So not sure if anyone can see the screen, but I'll go ahead and read those since it looks like maybe not. Um, one is limited roles for women. Then there's traditional masculinity, violence, silence, and power. And I think if we think about animal industries, whether that's entertainment or agriculture, um, we can really see how, and we've seen already, you know, limited roles for women, well, female animals as, you know, kind of the reproductive conduit to get what we need, and traditional masculinity. You know, we can even look beyond that to some of the jobs in these industries and how they really promote, um, you know, hegemonic and traditional and aggressive masculinity. And violence, of course, silence, I probably don't have to say anything more than ag gag. Um, and power to me is really important because, and again, I'm not sure if you can see the screen, but for um, the domestic violence, we tend to talk about power and control being at the core of the behavior. And to me, that really translates into this idea of entitlement, which we see everywhere. Might makes right, I can because I have the power. Um, and so we see that in both sides and how we treat animals and how we treat women. And power is one that's really, really um, important, I think, and that really, really is powerful <laughs> um, when we talk about these connections. So this is the power and control chart. And if, if there are those of you who do this work, you know it has been changed and modified and there are many versions. I just put the original one up to show when we talk about domestic violence in particular or intimate partner violence, we use a lot of different terms. 
um, you know, we really, really talk about the core being power and being control. And to me, that really lends itself well to this idea of entitlement, which in my work we talk about all the time. And so we talk about it like, um, you know, often we use the term might makes right and this idea of who has a right to use power, how do they use power, what is socially sanctioned, what isn't socially sanctioned. And to me, that all contributes to this underlying foundation that allows for animal exploitation, for violence against women. And if we are wanting to end both of these, we need to get to that core. We need to, um, I tend to use the house analogy a lot more because I think we talk a lot about, you know, pulling up trees from their roots and things like that, and I don't really like that. Um, it's easier to talk about maybe knocking a house down or something like that. But we really, we really need to look at those shared connections there and really the foundations that are allowing all of this to occur and how those manifestations of oppression really feed each other. And there's just so much more. Um, so this is where I, on my, my website, AshleyJoMeyer.com, just the blog, I um, intentionally left up my last post from January because I have an essay on there about comprehensive violence prevention that goes through a lot of these terms and concepts that I currently use in my work. They're very popular right now in work to prevent um, violence against women and gendered violence. And, you know, I ask questions like, well, we're talking about comprehensive prevention, but what do we mean by comprehensive? And what do we mean by society and community? And who are we leaving out there? Um, bodily autonomy is something that I, of course, always link back to Carol J. Adams' work. It's something we really, really value when we're talking about creating a healthy sexuality and having healthy relationships and promoting what we're for and not just um, talking about what we're against. We're for bodily autonomy. Well, what other industries are promoting a lack of bodily autonomy? I think we often leave that out. Um, false dichotomies, either or, human or animal, right? We, we really need to challenge those. And also these ideas of, um, of worth, um, these hierarchies of worth that I really do think we, we do accept. Um, I will say that, and it's a little scary to say it, but I think we accept it in, in the work to end gendered violence and a lot of human rights work. We really do accept um, these, these um, false dichotomies and these hierarchies of worth. And what's really, really one of the most frustrating things for me is, you know, we talk about intersectionality so often, you know, like I had said before, there's no one monolithic group of women, right? We all have intersecting different identities, which impact our experiences. Um, and, you know, we're so, so strong about intersectionality, but yet we stop. We limit ourselves. We only go to a certain point and then we stop. And this is where I think both movements really need each other to really expand our, our notions of what we're talking about when we're talking about gendered violence. And then consent, of course, is something that, I mean, I, I do a lot of work on sexual violence. We always talk about promoting consent. And there are all these um, kind of newish ways to talk about it. We talk about enthusiastic consent, um, just lots of ways to talk about it. But when you look at any kind of um, animal exploitation, how clearly is there a lack of consent there? And you know, my friend and I, who are both vegan, who both do work or have done work against sexual violence, talk about sitting at these tables at conferences where there's a speaker up there talking about some consent campaign or something, when everyone around us is being served the body of a non-consenting animal. So the resistance, I'll just go through this really quickly. There's the obvious. Um, there is the shaming of women's bodies and calling pubic hair fur and saying, you know, fur isn't sexy and all that kind of stuff. There's using and commodifying women bo women's bodies to promote our agendas, exploiting women's bodies, and really co-opting not only the language of the violence against women movement, that's something I hear a lot, but I can tell you that campaigns, and there was a recent campaign that looked just like this one except for it ends up in the end that it's talking about the abuse that lab rats experience are seen as really being just completely co-opted. So this one that I have on the screen right now is projectunbreakable.tumblr.com. Um, I think it was started at a university and it's where women or people who've experienced rape um, and sexual violence hold up signs saying what people said to them, um, what their rapists said to them. And this campaign about lab rats that some of you might have seen was seen as just completely copying this. 
And, you know, no matter how much we know that there doesn't have to be an either or here, this is the both and the experience of lab rats and the experience of women who um, and, and people who've experienced sexual violence are both, um, they're both horrific. They both have value in addressing and trying to end. Um, but campaigns like this face a lot of resistance and really make our work a lot harder uh, because they are really seen as, as truly as co-opting the work of the movement to end violence against women. So um, this comes from, in my undergraduate campus, um, we had a lot of painted on sidewalks that would say a rape happened here, it would be stenciled on there in red. Um, so someone's saying they cannot hear anything. Can anybody else hear something? I'm on the phone, so you should be able to hear. Okay, so it looks like people can hear. So um, hopefully we can figure out with that one person what's going on there. But um, so basically I always think back whenever I'm at like an animal rights conference, it's hard for me because I, and, and I just want to point out, I know this is kind of that stranger rape thing and we know that a lot of and most sexual violence occurs by people who are known to the person who's experiencing it. It does happen in, in places like this, on sidewalks and stuff too. And so I always think about it like we have this approach in animal rights, like this doesn't happen here, not in my town, but I have a hard time going to conferences because as soon as people find out what I do, I'm suddenly an advocate. I'm asked to be an advocate. I'm hearing people's stories. They're pointing out, I and mean, it happens in one, that man over there is stalking me. I need you to, to sit with me and be with me throughout this entire conference. So just to point out, it's happening in our movement and we absolutely have to address it. And I've had a lot of conversations about that. So let's revisit those five norms from the Prevention Institute. Let's look at how our own work is, if from animal rights perspective, uh, might be perpetuating those norms, which, you know, only undermines the work that we're trying to do. And so I wrote in a blog for Masculinities 101, which is from the State University of New York, I think on Long Island, um, they have a Center for Men and Masculinities. And so I wrote about meat masculinity. They showed that, unfortunately, one of the responses um, that we've had has been, oh, okay, well, we're going to say that, you know, vegetarianism and veganism is, is uh, manly as well. And so using those same norms to try to sell vegetarian and veganism and how you know, we don't need to be saying things like um, meat is for pussies and how that's actually really perpetuating norms of traditional masculinity and that's, that's undermining the work that we're trying to do. And a lot of times we say, if they only just knew about speciesism, then everything's going to change. What I can tell you through doing a lot of behavior change work and um, research is that a lot of times we see that awareness and knowledge does not translate into the actual behavior change and action. And speciesism especially, I found that when I bring that up or when I see others bring it up, it just gets laughter. Um, and so what I, and it shouldn't, I don't think it should, but it does. And so what I'm really hoping when we talk about the moving forward and making the connection between violence against women and animal rights is that we really focus on intentionality and accessibility. And I sometimes don't even use what I'm often training others to do, which is to get to know your audience. So I've had people say, um, and people in power over me say, you know, those those people who feel like X, Y, and Z about animals, so those people who think um, animals are just like children, um, those people are insane. And I've had immediate reactions of, well, I'm one of those people. And then the reaction I've gotten back is just as a matter of fact, well, then you're insane. And so I just really encourage, you know, thinking about who our audience is and the best ways that we can really get people to listen and to take us seriously. And it's unfortunate that, you know, we might have to be a little strategic, but I think that we'll get longer uh, or we'll get further in the long run that way. And one of the ways that I think it's really easy, especially when we're talking about violence against women and animal rights and the violence against women movement um, or the movement against gendered violence, really, you know, is a feminist movement and it's a place that you, to make those connections. I found it very easy to show or to start with how, how products, how animal products um, and feminized proteins are actually um, sexualized and how much sexism exists just in selling these projects or products. Because that gets people thinking about the product 
differently. And so once that thinking begins, it kind of continues on. And so that's been a really successful strategy for me. As well as, you know, we all have different areas of expertise. So this, you know, for those of you who know about public health, if you're um, doing work on health equity, then you'll see that there's been a lot of talk about food justice and food deserts. And so that's a place we can get people starting to think about animal agriculture and food and environmental racism and things that I think both the Vegan Project and Food Empowerment Project do very well in making those connections. And I'll tell you that when I tweet um, about like the Food Empowerment Project's uh, ethical vegan chocolate list, that's what gets most retweeted by the people who are my colleagues in working against violence against women. Also, let's recognize and pursue opportunities. You know, for me, being so deeply enmeshed in the movement to end um, gendered violence, I um, have been able to, you know, slowly and intentionally start making some of these connections and having these talks. This is from a workshop. When I was up, I was working in the Pacific Northwest. I knew the Washington Coalition Against Sexual Assault Programs, and they're having their annual conference. And, you know, with the experience I've had, I was able to kind of craft and present uh, a workshop that looked at some of the stuff we're talking about today, which is expanding our lens on rape culture. And so I encourage everybody to think about where you can kind of um, help make those connections and where you would have the credibility to get in there and, ta and start talking. Also, when I was in St. Louis, Missouri in the U.S., uh, around the time the U.S. started the Iraq War, um, we had a lot of war in Iraq, not in my name, um, uh, signs that were kind of all over the place. I found that to be very, very helpful to say, I know that organization just put out a really problematic campaign, and guess what? There are a whole bunch of us who are not on board with that. And so to show and to share things like the sexual politics of me and the vegan and everything else that makes the connection, let's show that other people get it too. And kind of this not in my name um, mentality I think is helpful at times. And also just live it. I uh, liken this to a long, longer time ago, I was at a national in the U.S., a national huge feminist conference. There was one other vegan kind of standing around, and we both decided when we were all being served pizza to ask for a nonviolent pizza. Well, it didn't go over so well. But years later, I was in the car, and my boss was telling, um, in the same car, was telling my coworker, Ashley's a great vegan, she just lives it. Um, she doesn't, you know, try to shove it down our throats and, and things like that that I know none of us like to hear, but it, it was, was really helpful to hear because she then went vegan. And so um, I think that's something to consider. And finally, let's build our community. Spaces like this are absolutely essential. Um, I uh, just every time I find someone that makes connections, which has been more and more every day, and I'm so thankful for as the years progress. Um, you know, I know how lonely this work is, and I'm feeling less and less alone. And so let's continue to build our community. You can contact me, ashleyjoemeyer.com. There's a contact form. Um, you can just click on that, and it'll send me an email, and I will correspond with you. So um, thank you again. I think this is a terrific forum, and I will see if there are any questions now. I, I think that there's definitely an issue, um, at least here in the United States, I can say that we have a lot of issues with being respected as women, even doing this work. Um, I think the same thing happens in the animal rights movement that happens in the movement and violence against women, where actually when men get into the work, and I'm actually writing a paper about this right now for a second master's program that I'm in, we find that um, men are often, we have this kind of glass elevator effect is what it's been called in the research. I don't know if you've, you've read that, um, where men are respected more right away. They're moved into management positions. Um, and so actually it's been easier for them um, to talk about this. And in my experience, that has, that has been true when I've um, I have often have many uh, male allies and friends who have had to back me up on things. Um, so all I can really speak to is my experience and some of the research that I've seen that really says it is, it's easier for men um, because they are seen more as experts just in general in life um, in addition to um, about this issue as well.